بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to all of our viewers returning to the Karima Foundation YouTube channel inshallah for I think an incredible I think it's going to be an incredible I'm really excited about this one because في ذكر الصالح أنزل البركة that in the, in the remembrance of the pious, the blessings of Allah Ta'ala descend. And I pray that this will be a gathering of immense blessings. And we're with two incredible scholars of the, the Western world uh, joining us today as well from across the proverbial palm. And so we're very honored to have both of them, a shaykh here. Uh, but inshallah, as always, and just before we start, if people could, could start sharing the link and and um, liking and just, just pushing it out there to spread the word as much as it's possible, inshallah ta'ala as well. But just because we're, we're slightly behind schedule, I just ask inshallah our resident Hafid, Hafid Hisham inshallah, to start with the recitation of Quran inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Wadduha والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى ولا الآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولا سوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة رب um, I, I thought that those verses were very um, pertinent to the discussion that we're going to have today because Surah Al Duha, and as the ulama who are in attendance know better than I do, is a surah about the light that comes after the darkness. And in moments of tribulation and sadness and grief, the recognition that Allah Ta'ala will unveil this, remove it, and the light will once again shine. And it reminds me of a statement, I'm not going to quote it in the Urdu, but Iqbal in the Jawab shikwa He says, somebody comes to me and says that the Ottomans have collapsed, and so what is there left for Islam? And he replies and says, you know, the Ottomans are gone, but doesn't the sun rise after the, de the demise of a thousand stars? That at night when the stars are out and they go down, then Allah Ta'ala sends the sun. And that even in these difficult times, I'm hoping that our, our teachers will give us a message of, of hope because we live, and as many people are aware, in, in the last few years, I don't know if it's unprecedented, it probably isn't, but maybe it's just us being so exceptionalist as, as modern people, but we've lost many scholars and many great luminary scholars. Sheikh Nuruddin Itr, Sheikh Amin Siraj, Sheikh Mahmoud Effendi, Allah Yarham, who just recently, um, Sheikh Mohammed Hadda Amin, who we're going to be talking about today, um, Mufti Sayyid Ahmed Balamburi, there's this incredible list in the last few years of great scholars of our tradition that have passed. And we believe, you know, that Imam Suti narrates the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said about people like this, that Yadfa'una bihim al Adab, that Allah Rabbul Izzati wa Jalal, He protects the community of the Prophet ﷺ through these people. They are like a shield holding back the punishment of Allah. And when they leave, suddenly there's this, this massive vacuum. And there's a hope that inshallah that this vacuum will be filled. Um, but there is a moment of sadness, and this is the idea of the end of times, Nazar ulama, that the ulama and knowledge will be taken through the taking of the scholars. And so um, I do hope, inshallah, that today's conversation will, will have some steps that the communities can take in producing people like this once again, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala as well, but also in remembrance of this great figure who stands. Um, Allah alam, I don't know enough about the Mauritanian tradition to speak about him, and that's what our teachers will provide. But we know that the Murabit al-Hajj passed away not long ago. And then Murabit Ahmed Fal passed away, and now Sheikh Muhammad Haddamin, rahmatullah alayhi, has also passed away. And it seems like there is this 
disappearance now of what was once. I remember there's a video of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf actually when he goes back to Mauritania and he's just like, everything's changed. Like things are not as they once were. And that is the way of the world. But it is a sense that even the, maybe the Mauritanian tradition is now starting to disappear and, and Allah Ta'ala knows best um, how, how things are faring. Um, but we're joined today. I'll just quick, quickly give a uh, quick introduction to our birth of our guests. So we're joined, uh, I'll start with the right, is my, my teacher, dear mentor, Sheikh Hamza Wal Maqbul, uh, who is from uh, America, who's from Chicago. Am I right in saying that, right? You're yeah. not from Chicago. I'm not actually from Chicago, but uh, I live in Chicago, yeah. Oh, you live in Chicago at the moment. And so he started uh, his journey, I think, after university. He went to study at various uh, places in the Arab world, Morocco, uh, Syria, I think. Uh, and then he spent time in Mauritania as well. And then he went to uh, Pakistan, where he completed the traditional Dars in Adami and also attained uh, qualifications with various scholars and mashayikh over there. And um, he obviously spent time. Now, currently, he runs the Ribat Institute, I think, uh, in America. You can follow the, he has a SoundCloud where you can listen to his lessons and dars, and it's amazing. And he's also, uh, I think, one of the resident scholars at the Imam Ghazali Institute, um, which we hosted. We had we did a program with them recently, uh, not long ago. And then our other guest is uh, Sheikh Rami Ansur, who um, spent seven years studying with the scholars of Mauritania. Um, and then he also now currently runs, um, and he's done a lot of work, actually, Sheikh, you've done a lot of work in translating the texts of the Mauritanian scholars and using them in the organization you run, the Deba Foundation, which uh, allows prisoners to learn the traditional Islamic sciences. Um, and so books, texts like the prohibitions of the Tanah Maharim and Nisan and others, um, we, we, we have benef we've benefited from these texts um, of the Mauritanian tradition that you provided for us. Um, so, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to both of you first. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you both doing? Alhamdulillah, doing well. Thank you for, for inviting us and having us on this uh, program. Alhamdulillah. Um, I think I'll start with you, maybe Sheikh Rami, um, just, just to kick things off. We this idea that you said Murabit al Hajj and you've you've done some lectures and things that you can find on YouTube where you've spoken about him and then Murabit Ahmed Fa'al and then Murabit Haddamin. What is what I mean, who who are these people and what is the significance of this this sort of Mauritanian tradition of learning that people from the West have gone, maybe famously starting with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, but then so many others after him to take from and and and, and who are these people and where, where, where does this even idea of the Murabit come from also? Yeah. Um, well, to begin with, you know, um, of course, as you know, about a, a week ago or a little over a week ago, we lost one of these Murabits, Murabit uh, Muhammad Al-Amin, also more commonly known as Hadd Amin. And he is he is one in a long line of this tradition of the Murabitin and where it comes from. I mean, we can go um, into a more historical discussion about that. Actually, Sheikh Hamza um, here knows more about that historical introduction of the Murabitin movement into Mauritania. So I would defer to him on that. But in terms of this family specifically, um, Murabit Haddamin um, is from the tribe of Masuma. And Masuma is a tribe within the Mauritania tribal structures of what's called the Zawaya tribe. So long ago, however it happened, some say by engineering, by social engineering, by having specific intentions, others say it just that's the way it emerged, um, that certain tribes became known with certain things. So you have the, the craftsmen's tribes which do the blacksmithing and the carpentry and the, the brick building and so forth. And then you have the warrior tribes, the Bani Hassan, that their main thing was really just like Jahiliya, um, getting land, stealing land, raids, tribal raids, fights, wars, and so forth. Um, all of that tribal warrior history that we read from the days of Jahiliya, our shiuch have told us that's how they were living in Mauritania, the Bani Hassan, Bani Hassan tribe. Then there's the Zawaya tribe that they prided themselves and they made their culture to be ilm. They would have people that would ha that would have weapons and know how to use them, but they said our thing is not um, uh, amassing uh, date palms and camels and cows and, you know, herds and livestock and, and weapons and, and all of this um, warrior culture and tradition. Our pride, our bread and butter is ilm. And so the Masuma tribe that Murabit al-Hajj and Murabit Ahmed Fal and Murabit Haddamin all come from come from the Masuma tribe that are one of these Zawaya tribes. So that's 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 where they that's where they come from. Um, the Murabit 
Shiyukh is a is a is a title given to Shiyukh there um, that stems from the Morabitlin who who had led one of the 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 subsequent there was initial invasions of Mauritania to to establish it as a Muslim country and then later on the Morabitlin also came into that area so that's where where that title comes from but the idea is these men who sit in ribats in spiritual fortresses not on a militaristic um, uh, situation but more of ribat ala ala sharia murabitin ala sharia on the sharia they're there morning noon and night they're there through the night they're there, like if you went to Mauritania when I first went there in 1998 you saw Murabit al-Hajj you saw his his routine you knew what Ahmed Murabit Ahmed Fan was doing you know what Murabit Haddamin was doing up until a week ago any point of the day you could without even knowing what they were doing we could know what they were doing we could say oh if it's duha time the, and you started off with surah al-duha they're praying duha and they're they're up at tahajjud time and teaching they're between reciting quran and teaching students and 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 maintaining their ibadah throughout the day um for for myself I heard about Mauritania and the stories of Murabat al-Hajj. I didn't know the other shiukh. I had seen pictures of Murabat Ahmed Fal. I saw a picture of Murabat Haddami, but I didn't know who they were. I went there because I heard, actually my story is, I, I met some of the shiukh that came. I met Murabat al-Hajj's grandson, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Wild Ahmedna, and also Sheikh Khatri Wild Bayba, who's the brother-in-law of Murabat al-Hajj. I saw them, and my, my feeling was, wherever these men came from, I want to go there. So it really wasn't I need to study the Maliki Madhab and I'm going there. I went there because I found these these human beings, these men, and I wanted to go where where they were. When I got to Mauritania uh, after a, a long journey, um, and I, um, when I was in one of the the cities, and I was going up to Murabat al Hajj's school, I just that was the only name that I knew. But there was a student I could still remember him telling me this. We were in Gero in Sheikh Muhammad Ahmed's house, the brother of uh, Sheikh Khatri, uh, the brother of, of Maryam, who's the wife of Murabat al-Hajj. So this is all, we're going into a faculty of, of ulama, but we're also going into a family, and they took us in as family. Uh, but when we were when I was staying at one of the, the, the family members, I remember the first time I heard Haddamin's name, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, and somebody told me, oh, you're going to see Haddamin. But it really didn't click because I was on my way to see Murabat al-Hajj. And when I got there um, and I visited, I saw Murabat uh, al-Hajj, I remember Haddamin the first time I saw him. It was right about the time of, of Asr. He was standing on the what would be the, the south side of the masjid. So if the Qibla is this way, his house, between him and his house is about maybe 100 feet. And, and that pathway, you know that pathway from Haddamin's house to the masjid, just like Murabat al-Hajj is directly due west of the masjid. That's a well-worn uh, path between Marabat al-Hajj's house and the masjid. The whole day is around around the salah. So I saw Haddamin standing there and there were students around him. And one of the other students explained to me, he said, when you take a lesson, you're not just going to study with Marabat al-Hajj, you're also going to study with the other shiuch. So it took a while for me to learn that method because I said, okay, I have my lesson. I'm go I study with Murabat al-Hajj, I'll go study it. But then I started seeing other students, they would take the same lesson with multiple shuyukh. And then that, and there's a powerful um, uh, thing to be said about that. So I started studying with Haddamin and immediately, and anybody, and I'm sure, I know Sheikh Hamza had the same experience and anybody else as well, when they go there, as soon as you start studying with him, there's this, connection that's made whereas when i would sit with murabat al-hajj it was like i would i would look at him as a human being but he's not in this world he's like he's in this world but he's not in this world he'll ask you how you're doing and then start the lesson but he's he's out of the dunya whereas haddamin he will ask you about um uh, about things get to know you and engage in conversation in addition to the lesson so then pretty soon you have a teacher, you have a mentor, you have a friend, you have somebody who cares about you, who brings milk to his students, who gives food to his students, who's asking about his students, and all the shiuch do that. But Haddamin had something, there was, there's something more about his relationship with his students. And it's best summed up by one of the, the students that I met there. He said, the Mauritanians say, we come to Murabat al-Hajj's school for Murabat al-Hajj, but we don't leave because of Haddamin. Like the pull to the Mahdara is Murabat al-Hajj, but that, that connection, that really intimate connection to the point that, wallahi, and I'll say this with you know complete sincerity, 
there was a point when I was studying there that I, I felt I was Haddamin's favorite student. I was his favorite student. And I didn't want to share this with other students because I thought, oh, this is, this is special for me. Like he really, like I am the favorite student out of the Mauritanians, out of everybody who comes from outside of Mauritania. And then little by little, as I speak to other people, I find that everybody's having this experience. Everybody feels that they're his favorite student. And we know from studying the Shema, and that's the way the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would make his Sahaba feel that they are this most, the, 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 the exclusive, you know, in terms of the best of friendship. And then they had to ask him, well, who is most beloved to you? Because everybody felt they were the most beloved, but that's, that, that's Haddamin. Everybody was beloved to him. He, he would talk to everybody. Um, uh, he, he knew about everybody's uh, connections, what they're going through. He would have time, a lot, private discussions with people. He would have discussions with people out um, uh, in front of the other students. And it really, he built up, he built up amazing relationships um, with everybody to the point that when, when I got the news that he had passed away, this flood of memories came over because I, sat at his feet every single morning for the period about of, of a, a little over four years and i realized how much of my life and who i am is from him and i realized how much of a father figure he is to me and it's interesting how this happens sometimes only once a person passes um, at least my experience i i didn't realize who my father my biological father dr salam and rahmatullahi who he was to me until he was on his deathbed and then it finally clicked for me who he was to me. And it's a, it's an, it's, it seems like it's unfortunate, but that's also part of the wiratha. The wiratha, the, the inheritance, only occurs once a person passes away. Mm -hmm. I asked one of the, the, the foremost students of Murabat al-Hajj who was in severe uzla. Like he was, he lived in a cave. He didn't speak to anybody except for Murabat al-Hajj. His name is uh, Sheikh Muhammad Wild al-Aziz. And he also went to Hajj by foot, but he only got to uh, Sudan and had to turn around because of not being able to continue. And I asked him one time, I said, who is going to be the Khalifa of Murabat al-Hajj? And he said, the Odia say that you will not know who's going to inherit the wilaya and the Khilafah of a person until that wali passes away themselves. And so there's something there about once the passing occurs, then some of the wiratha happens afterwards. Um, in any case, I this flood of memories came over to me in all of these these, these images of, 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 of my interactions with him. And I realized... Uh, I just realized a lot more about how I am today is through through him, um, and I wanted to share just a few uh, a few things you know about his life um, and some of the interactions that I've had with, uh, with with him over the years that really impacted me. But one of the things is, um, and these are all directly that I've heard from him him directly. So he started studying as a very young child, and he said it was really his mother who made sure that he was. Um, he was at his Quran lessons. And it's important for us to know these things because like, as you said earlier, you know, when the ulama, when these stars, when they, when they, when they go out, um, who's going to replace them? We know that every time a, a scholar dies, there's a, a farag, a, an emptiness that's created in the house of Islam that's not going to be filled by somebody else. So in reality, nobody's going to replace Murabat al-Hajj. Nobody is going to replace Murabat al-Hamid Fal. Nobody's going to replace Haddamin. We're going to have inheritors but it's going to be different. It's going to be um, it's going to be a different person, and so it's important to know that once we lose these people, well, how did they how did they get to where they they they, they are today? So Haddamin's journey with Elm started very young. His mother would would take him to his Quran teacher, and he said he told me he said she would sit outside the tent where he was studying just to make sure that he actually focused on his lessons because a lot of kids if they're not uh, being watched and it's a large group of kids they might just kind of bide their time and then the lesson's over and then they sneak off and they run away she would make sure that he's studying he told me that he, he told me himself that he finished memorizing the quran by the time he was 10 years old and started studying the rasam the, the the method of writing the quran and everybody in the village said you're too young you're not going to understand that because it's 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 a complicated science to know you know to to know exactly how to write out the quran and which is, you know, which word uh, is written in the Uthmani script and how is it done and what's mahdhuf and what's thabit and so on and so forth. And he mastered it when he was 10 years old. And then he began his study of fiqh. He started studying his fiqh and I asked him, I said, when did you finish or when did you finish your first time through of Khalil? 
he said, I don't know exactly, but I know that I got to the Bab of Nikah, which is a little more about halfway of this major text. He said, I got halfway to Nikah before I was balad, before I was of age. Um, he studies. The Khalil is like the Malik equivalent of the Hidayah, right? Uh, even higher than Hidayah. So, Probably um, like Sheikh Hamza, would you say Radul Muhtar? I mean, they're 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 qualitatively different books. It's going to uh, uh, it's going to take us in a different direction, but it's similar to the Hidayah in the sense that this is the the first place you look for the fatwa position of the Madhab. Okay. Yeah, he, um, he's, he's and, right that it's there's there's a lot more in terms of the number of rulings that are uh, uh, enumerated than the Hidayah. So he, he, he studied that, he memorized it. In the Mauritans, they memorize everything. And on his second time after studying Khalil, he studied a commentary along with the Khalil that's called the Mughni, that's done one by one of the scholars of the mountainous region where they live called Taganit. And um, the Mughni is a, is a very abridged commentary of Khalil. Haddamin had memorized the first time through the, the, the Nas, the text of Khalil, on the second time through, he memorized along with it the commentary, and he said his 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 memorization was so proficient that he would he would recite them together. He would recite the text with the commentary, and that went on to 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 him studying um, uh, him studying all of the other ulum, uh, getting ijazas and and asanid in in um, in in many of the of the texts, um, and then one very important thing about uh, to to know about Haddamin is that. The tradition in West Africa, the Mahdara tradition, is that once a person reaches a high level to where they can teach themselves, they usually break off or go back to their family and start their own Mahdara, their own center of learning. Haddamin loved his cousin, Murabat al-Hajj, so much that he stood next to him. And so, and this was very, very unique about him because it's almost like he he had to, he humbly accepted a position of second in command where he could have gone anywhere else. In Mauritania, he even had uh, um, uh, job offers from uh, from the Hijaz. He could have gone anywhere else, but he said, no, I'm going to stand next to Murabat al-Hajj. And one time I asked him, I said, are you going to ever leave Tuimrat? That's the name of the, the village where they, the Mahdara. He said, I'm going to die here and be buried right next to Murabat al-Hajj. And subhanAllah, as it turned out, he died in Kifa. But he made sure before he died, he always told his family. I mean, he was he's been t talking about this for the last 20 years. I want my I want to be buried in Tuimrat. And it was that that um, steadfastness on the importance of keeping that Mahdara there that he was looking for the longevity because there were people talking about, oh, let's move closer to the cities. He said, no, we need to stay here. And so he pushed for making sure that water wells were dug. He pushed for making sure that people had housing, that the students had support, that they had housing to the point now that it's a, it's a, it's, it's established. Like now he's passed and people are talking about moving into Toimrat from, from his extended family. Um, one thing too, that really struck me about him is he told me this himself that as a young as a young boy, young teenager, he was very um, focused on his deen, whereas other people might, you know, take some time to be shabab and do things shabab do, young people do. And he said people would tease him about this. And they would say, oh, Haddamin, you want to you wanna be a, a righteous person. Are you trying to be a wali? Salih is the term they use there for a wali and it's also found in the books as well it's interchangeable salih and wali but they're saying oh are you trying to be with all this like taqwa that you're doing and are you trying to and they would say it in a teasing fashion almost like uh mockery of him uh but the reality is subhanallah he did turn out to be that in addition to his ilm he has a deep 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 level of salah of righteousness he told me himself he said he said there's nothing that i have ever it's the head fit fit dua that I really, really focused on making dua, he said, except that it came true. And I've tried this a couple times with him where one time I had, you know, one of my students through Taiba who was a, who had a life sentence. And when I went on one of my trips to Mauritania, this was in 2005 or six or seven around that time. And I, and I shared with him, I said, um, um, I said, you know, please make dua for him to, to be released from prison. And, and he said he will. A few years later, so let's see, actually 2012, so about five or six years later, on a trip there, I told him, I said, I want to let you, and I remember clearly, he was sitting on this sand dune in a, in a moonlit night, 
and he was using his miswak. And I remember the, 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 the setting clearly, clear as day. And I said, I just want to let you know that student that I asked for you to make dua for to, to have released from prison, from a life sentence in prison, he was released. And he had his uh, he has his miswak and he said, he said, yeah, I was sure of it. I made dua for him. <laughs> like that's how sure he was about his dua that he knows that once he makes it, he had in his dua, he, it, it, it would be answered. And so he had this deep, deep, deep devotion in the village. At the end of the night, the first fire that's lit in the village was Haddamin's fire. You know he was up at 3, 4 a.m. Uh, reciting Quran, praying his tahajjud, getting ready to teach his students little kids Quran at, um, uh, at, the, at the end of the night. Like he would be teaching students on one side of his, of his halaqah, of his circle, students teaching them alif bata. And on the other side, he's teaching people nahu and fiqh and logic and mantaq and astronomy. I learned astronomy from Haddamin, and I wanted to maybe a little bit later share uh, a, a little bit of that. Um, but I remember one time clearly he was he was he was on his left. He was teaching a student, and the student kept making mistakes in the noon and the ba, or there was something. It was about about a dot, and I was studying something, and he turned to the student and he said. Um, um, like noon has one dot on top of it. It's not a time. Noon has one dot. And and your Lord is one. And he was and and he was really getting like animated. And I thought to myself, oh man, the sheikh's getting angry at this student over here because he was messing around and not getting his lesson. And when he turns back, it's just like if you're speaking with somebody and they turn and they yell at somebody, you know it's gonna transfer over here when they turn back to you. So he's literally, he turns to his left and he's yelling at the student. And I'm thinking, oh man, I'm in the middle of my lesson. He's going to turn back. But subhanAllah, he turned back with the widest smile and the most welcoming face. And from and, and he said, continue your lesson. I learned from that, that his getting angry with students was not emotional. It was not venting frustration. And Sheikh Muhammad Malou talks about this in his book on teaching uh, children, he said it is haram to 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 punish a child in instruction if you're doing it out of shifa ul ghayf, just to vent your frustration. And um, I saw this with Haddamin; it was a tool, and it was a tool because he could turn it on and off, you know, in the middle of the lesson. And then after the lesson, the students would literally his kids and the young students would climb over him just like the cubs climb over a lion. So when they talk about the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam being like a lion with his cubs, that was Haddamin with his kids. They would come around there with the most loving uh, interactions with him. But when it came time for the studies, he was very serious about it. Um, I could share more and more, but I want to, I don't want to turn this into a long extended monologue. Um, maybe when it gets to the conversation, it'll That's perfect. Just our memories for me. Um, maybe I'll turn this now over to Sheikh Hamza. Sheikh Hamza, you're very unique in that you're a, a Maliki Pakistani. Um, so I, I, that's intriguing in and of itself. Um, and so somehow you ended up in Mauritania to study the Maliki fiqh and with the scholars of Mauritania. And so I was wondering maybe if you could share with us your journey to Mauritania and your experience with Murabid Haddamin. And also, did you and Sheikh Rami happen to be there at the same time, maybe? And if you did, who was the who was Murabid Haddamin's favorite? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa kafa wa salamun ala ibadahi ladhi nastafa. I, to be honest with you, I am attending this because I was asked uh, in honor of our uh, teacher, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, raise his uh, rank and give him a rank amongst the awliya uh, uh, in this world and the hereafter. Um, and I can listen to, mashallah, Sheikh Rami's uh, monologue uh, about Haddamin uh, the whole day. And to be honest with you, he spent a lot more time with him and has more right to uh, uh, speak about him. Um, but alhamdulillah, mashallah, yeah, we did, you know, we did not overlap. I think Sheikh Rami had gone back to America for some time. And to be honest with you, I didn't spend in Mauritania uh, uh, much more than six months. Uh, and uh, so I was in America at that time, but we overlapped in the sense that we knew each other and corresponded. He had helped me to uh, uh, make it over there. Making it to Tuamirat is not an easy thing. It's not just like you just don't buy tickets and show up. Um, it's it's not an easy thing to do. And so he helped me uh, immensely. And I also have the distinction of having stayed in his tent for some time. 
uh, which I uh, nicknamed the Rami Hilton. But now that I think about it, there's no Hilton in the world that, uh, you know, uh, I would rather stay in than, than that tent, mashallah. Allah Ta'ala reward him and put whatever benefit I gained in his mizan al-hasanat. Haddamin uh, rahimahullah tabarak wa ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala immerse him in mercy. It's very hard to, you know, talk about and think about, uh, you know, uh, people like that passing, it's very hard to say still about Murabit uh, rahimahullah ta'ala and a number of other mashayikh and scholars that we benefited from because we always, I always thought about them as like safety net that, you know, I am who I am and uh, I have, uh, you know, a lot of shortcomings in uh, what I do and what I say even when I'm trying to be a good person and uh, I have shortcomings in that attempt as well. But I always had in the back of my mind that there's some sort of safety net uh, that that uh, all of this can land on, and it's very scary to think about, you know, uh, those people not physically being uh, there anymore. Um, I, it's difficult to explain. But at any rate, uh, all I can say is that Krami mentioned uh, he treated the students of knowledge. Uh, as if they are the guests of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can imagine amongst Mauritanians, uh, they probably weren't the wealthiest people because they were not in the cities. Um, they lived essentially in a pastoralist life where their wealth was in their herds. Uh, and if it wasn't for milk, uh, you know, the mashaykh, their own families probably would have died of uh, malnutrition uh, if it wasn't for the animals and, and things like that. Uh, and yet, and yet, uh, they would give, they wouldn't take from people, they would give. And uh, I remember I stayed in the tent for some time. And then after some time, I actually went to, you know, kind of shamelessly, Allah forgive me. I went to Haddamin and I said, uh, uh, I said, it's difficult for me. It's difficult for me to stay in the tent and for me to do all these things. I said, can I sleep in your library? And he not only, he didn't bat an eyelash, but he made arrangements without me asking. Uh, he made arrangements for all of my meals that I sat and ate with the family, which is somewhat of a shameless thing to do. It's kind of bad adab to impose yourself on people like that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, he did it so, to such a degree that I remember once I was out speaking with some of the other students, uh, just hanging out with some of the other students, I should say, uh, and it was time for food. And he sent his eldest son, who was present in the Mahdara at the time, uh, Muhammad Mustafa, uh, literally like from tent to tent to find you can't just you're not going to text a person there was you know a, a, there's no technology there i'm told now that there's cell phone signal if you stand up on a hill or something like that in those days you had to have a satellite phone in order to contact anybody electronically um, so he sent him tent to tent to find me and said the food is ready and i felt like a, a, a pretty much like a scumbag but uh you know it goes a long way it goes a long way that when you're back in america and there's all this internet and there's fitan and there's money and there's people telling you, oh, well, this is not, you know, you, we don't have to do this. And Sheikh so-and-so said, this is okay. And the piety and righteousness and certainty of those people and the uh, complete uh, itqan and perfection of the ulum, the knowledge of those people, like, why am I here? Who am I? Why am I here? What's my place in the world? It starts to seem distant and everything is blurry. Uh, and I remember, like, I just remember those things that these people, they had like next to nothing, uh, uh, despite being worthy of literally being kings and having inside themselves, inside their hearts and inside of their minds, uh, enough knowledge and enough righteousness and enough resolve to literally being kings and judges and people who civilization uh, is established uh, on their strength. Um, their contentment with these things, not only they had less, but they actually gave from what they had and always the feeling of indebtedness uh, is there that when I feel burned out and I feel annoyed with people and I feel like they don't give and they don't listen and they don't this and that. I think, you know, you didn't memorize even one of your lessons. I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about Sheikh Rami. Rami Sheikh Rami memorized his lessons. You didn't memorize one of your lessons. Uh, you, you were a bum and uh, you just were there to hang out even by their uh, you know, standards. You're not, not really a student of knowledge. Uh, but even then, uh, never a cross word never uh, uh, any any anger or indignation. Uh, every time I came to Dars, always the door was open. And, uh, uh, you know, it's not like they don't notice. It's not like they don't notice your, your shortcomings, you know. Uh, Sheikh Haddamin, when 
I left Mauritania. Uh, I, I asked him permission to study with his eldest son. And that's a whole nother story about, you know, how he took me in and how he took care of me and how I benefited from, from him uh, without making claims of being something. Um, but despite all of that, you know, uh, he gave me his contact information. And uh, he also, I stayed with him for, you know, nearly two years and uh, read from him. All of it comes to or culminates in this understanding that the knowledge is important. It's more important than money. Uh, like uh, Sheikh Rami said about uh, Haddamin having the opportunities to have jobs and go other places and be a big sheikh and make money and comfortable lifestyle, etc. Uh, I know places uh, in the Muslim world where there are judges uh, that are from his class in terms of uh, in terms of being from Mauritania and from the same tribal setup and the similar education and in knowledge they're lower than him and they lived in huge villas and God bless them for dispensing uh, you know the law of the Sharia you know as it was revealed uh, to the best of their abilities that he had the possibility of not only doing what they did but exceeding them and uh, the idea is what is that the knowledge is like in the calculation of things it's worth more than the money. And it's worth more than the ease and it's worth more than the uh, uh, prestige and the position and all of that. And not only did he see that for himself, but also in the students, because you don't treat somebody with that much uh, ikram and that much uh, hospitality unless you see that these people are worth something, that they're going to carry something with them that's that's worth something with Allah. There's a day that's going to come that that all of it is going to pay off. And, uh, you know, I saw that, 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 that honor and dignity without arrogance, but the honor and dignity in the knowledge and in uh, teaching and in learning that there's no, no sheikh is too big to teach Alif Ba Ta Tha to the kids. No sheikh is too big to, uh, you know, uh, to teach, uh, th you know, those people who are, you know, struggling with issues. It's very interesting because we would tell them about some of the stuff that happens in America, um, Oh, you know, men want to marry men, and this, these types of things are like completely unimaginable for somebody out in the in the Badia. And he would just be like, "Alhamdulillah, I'm here." <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was not he was not excited about any of it, but he knew that these people that you know come from these places where they have these weird issues, um, uh, uh, that that still they're they're people of value, and they're going to do something of value, and it helped us also the knowledge uh, when I've actually seen people forget about anywhere else. I've seen people from the subcontinent. I've seen even people from Mauritania that have memorized books and this and that. Someone once told me, he said that I I, I wasted my life uh, memorizing the Mukhtasar Khalil where I should have read Sahih Bukhari. I said, trust me, if you come with this attitude, even reading Bukhari is not going to help you. Uh, but uh, this this idea that that not only in the mind was the information plugged in uh, to superior level, but in the heart there was a, a, a very clear map and compass and orientation and direction of where he was going. And uh, it drove him to you know, behave in a, in a way that's not like how other people behave. And, uh, uh, you know, for that, I, I'll be indebted for him forever that those few, uh, you know, those few days I stayed with him and that those me meals that I ate with him and the haraj I put his family through, that uh, I, I think about it now every time when I uh, go and, you know, do some sort of khidmat or some sort of class or dars or whatever, uh, you know, I think of him, I remember him, that uh, I went to Hajj so many times uh, and it wasn't, no one would have, you know, I would have never been able to go on my own and no one would have taken me if this uh, Mubarak ilm, if we didn't have just this last year, mashallah, people are familiar. I don't want to get into the details of it, but they're familiar with some of the stuff that happened with Hajj that the group leaders and the ulama were not really able to go with the, the groups anymore. And so uh, I, I thought I'm going to open a telegram channel just to be there for people to answer their masail. And so something like I think about 470 or so people uh, signed up for that telegram group. And I would wake up in the night like after two, three hours just to answer the questions. Because when you need a question answer, sometimes the time is of the essence. And, uh, uh, you know, all of it is the mashaykh, the people who taught us these these ahkam that, we, that I personally was completely heedless of. I had no idea, you know, zakat was like 2.5%, nothing beyond that. I knew I knew nothing about hajj except for, you know, you have to go to Makkah Mukarramah and walk around the Kaaba. I had no idea what is Arafat, what is Mina, what is any of these things. Um, uh, they they taught us what these things are, and uh, you know if we do a lifetime of service, it goes in their hisab, 
and uh, uh, and there are people that are like us by the dozens, if not by the hundreds, uh, if not like us, then better than us. And uh, all of it is the fruit of this uh, uh, reverence that, that they carried in their heart and that we saw from them. If I didn't see it, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, but I saw it and I, I you know, whenever I remember it, it, it has an effect on me. When you, it seems like, Shah Hamza, you, you, in your initial studies, went to Mauritania at the beginning. Did you ever go back after when you detained maybe? A, I don't know, because it seems like you're saying that there was maybe a lack of maturity in that initial journey. And did you ever go back? And, and, and So I, I went to Mauritania uh, twice. Uh, uh, and each each time was just a couple of months. And they were those two trips were essentially within within about a year, and uh, um, the rest of the time I was with uh, that I studied with the Mauritanians, I was with the uh, the son of uh, of Murabit Haddamin, Sheikh Muhammad, um, in uh, in his place of residence, which was in the Gulf. Um, this is it ties in actually a bit to you're asking why why am I a Maliki. One of our big mashallah uh, mullahs of the home in uh, the UK, uh, he once, when I met him later on in America, said, oh, huh, Desi Maliki, you know, what are you trying to, are you trying to rebel against? You think you're cool as a cool people madhab or what's going on here, you know? And so I said, no, I said, I said, this story is very simple. I said, I took the Mukhtasar Quduri to a number of mashayikh before I went to study and none of them had time for me. And uh, I said that I tried to, uh, take uh, admission in the big madars of Pakistan at the time. And uh, they all said no. And later on, I, I would go and study in Pakistan later on after having achieved some sort of uh, level of competence as a student of knowledge. And, uh, you know, I was admitted. But at the time, uh, when I just had studied very little, uh, I was told, I remember a particular incident I was told by the uh, principal of a madrasa. I said, how old are you? I said, I'm 24. I said, do you have any college degrees? I said, yeah, I have a degree in biochemistry. He said, my mashra is that you go back and serve the Muslims with your biochemistry degree instead. And I remember the complete uh, unwelly like unsaintly level of anger that entered into my heart. And I didn't tell him off, uh, although I really wanted to badly. And I've forgiven him because that madrasa in particular I think something like out of the last 10 principles, like seven of them were assassinated. So they're very sensitive about, they're very sensitive about things because they have their own issues and no one can hold that against them. Uh, but uh, I thought to myself when going home, like really dejected and heartbroken, I said, you know what? Had that mean like let me into his, uh, in, in, into his uh, home and he taught me, knowing that I wasn't yet even a Maliki. I just, I still used to pray like Hanafi, still all those things. I was just reading because that's what you go there to read. And uh, he never asked any questions. He never gave me any grief. And if today I, I went back, you know, he wouldn't say a word to me. And so, uh, you know, this is a ishara that uh, that maybe this is where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala made the khair for you. And this is ishara also that these are people that their knowledge is worth serving uh, for you more than others. Not to say anything bad about the rest of them, but for me personally, that this is this is who, you know, who Allah Taala, you know, put the barakah in for me. So I went back. I went back to Sheikh Muhammad and to to his father, and uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I I feel I, again. I don't make any claims. I, I am a Maliki. I don't make any claims of being a you know a faqih of the Maliki madhab. I practice the madhab and I teach the basic mutun fardain level stuff uh, to people that I've, I've felt in my own life a lot of khair and a lot of barakah in it without any sort of putting any other madhab down or saying this is better than that or any of those types of things. You know, people say, well, I want to study this, I want to study that. I said, they're all, all the madhab of the sunnah, they're all pathways uh, to Allah Ta'ala. They're not the, the end, they're a means to, to, to meet, reaching Allah Ta'ala in a superior one. If you can't study the Maliki school, I don't have tasul with people. I said, study what's, what's available to you close by. Uh, but for me personally, Allah Ta'ala put a lot of barakah in it and, and it opened a lot of doors for me uh, that otherwise wouldn't have been opened. Uh, and all of it was just because of that, because I knew that this is a person I could rely on, that the entire rest of the world would fail me, but he wouldn't fail me. And it is, it does hurt a bit, you know, like not to complain. It hurts a bit when somebody like that is gone. Uh, a person wonders, you know, like what else, uh, what else am I going to do? 
uh, and so that's a little bit of that. I don't want to make this like too much sniveling or whatever, but there are some people in the world, they're special. They're not really replaceable. Allah Ta'ala, you know, takes upon himself the, 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 you know, the task of keeping the ummah alive and everything going. And inshallah, you know, it doesn't fall apart because of any one person. But that's one of the special things about these people that they really are irreplaceable. You might find somebody who fills in the gap for them, but you won't find anyone like them anymore. And so, you know, all we can do is we can make dua for them and try better than what we've been trying in terms of, you know, doing the service that they used to do. And, uh, uh, you know, just hope uh, that Allah Ta'ala one day uh, uh, that we don't mess things up for ourselves as well. Uh, and that one day we can meet again and that uh, they, they see that uh, those meals that they used to, you know, give us and that annoyance that they used to bear with, with, you know, a stranger and Ajnabi sleeping in their house and all of those things that one day that we can show them something from whatever little we did, that it, it was worth it. Sheikh, that, that's that's very very beautifully put, Sheikh Hamza. I, I didn't mean any. I hope I didn't come across as disrespectful when I asked you why you were Maliki. Um, uh, Sheikh Rami, um, you spoke about the the fact that um, Sheikh Murabit Haddamin stood with Murabit Al Hajj. Would you mind maybe explaining the relationship between them two? Because wasn't Sheikh Murabit Haddamin considered the Khalifa or the successor of Murabit Al Hajj once he passed away as well? Rahimahumullah Taala. Yeah, so um, the way I look at it, and is that you know the hadith al ulama warathatul anbiya is widely mentioned, widely looked at, commonly misunderstood from a number of angles. Um, like Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said, actually, this hadith is misunderstood in that people think that the wiratha is ta'zim and khidma and hadaya, that you have to give gifts and that you have to do khidma. He said that's not the wiratha that's spoken about. This is in his book, Uddatul Murid al Sadiq. The wiratha that is spoken about by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that al ulama warathatul anbiya is al ilm wal hal. That's their wiratha. And so you you find, and I've, I've seen ulama, real ulama, not people who think they're ulama, they are ulama, that, 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 that they see this hadith of we're the inheritors of the Prophet, and so then we get the whole. Everything we get all of that, all of what he got, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We get that too, and so khidma for him, ihtiram for him. And so, if the alim comes into the society thinking that their position of ilm and that their nisba, their portion of wiratha, is khidma and is is ta'zim, is like grand, being grand, they're misunderstanding what that is. And Sidi Ahmed Zarruq says it's al ilm al hal to show you. You know, when you find the ulama who who actually get this. You find people like Haddamin. I heard this that one time there was a group of students sitting, and you know, there's a lot of because of the desert, there's a lot of um, dust and dried animal dung and dried, you know, things, and so you really you you get a lot of phlegm, and so people are spitting all the time, to the point that it became a habit for me that I had to break consciously when I come back to the West because it's like it's Aib over here, over there it's not Aib, it's actually like you have to clear out your your lungs and your throat, and it's just it's constant, um, and that. And there's also sometimes a lot of wind. Well, one time a student was clearing his throat, Mauritanian student, and spit into the wind, and it came and it hit Haddamin in the face. And he very, in a dignified way, just wiped it off, and he said, well, it's Tahir, and pushed it away. That student didn't intend to do that. But this is the type of... Um, uh, like humility that you find with him, like what Sheikh Hamza was mentioning about if he care, you know, he didn't even bat an eye when he, you can uh, stay at my library and we'll bring you food and I'll send my eldest son to look for you, to do khidmah of you. And I've seen Haddamin carry milk to, to, to his students. Um, I've seen him do the khidmah himself. So he has that humility. That wiratha that Murabat al Hajj got as being, you know, from Warathatul Anbiya. He also got it in his community. And so just like the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got Sahaba, Murabat al-Hajj got that as well. So to give you an example, Murabat al-Hajj's Mu'adhin, Sheikh Muhammad Ali, who is one of the most famous Quran reciters in the area, who learned from Sheikh Muhammad Ahmed, who's the brother-in-law of Murabat al-Hajj. So Murabat al-Hajj is married to Maryam. Baryab's brother is Muhammad Ahmed. For those in the West who know Sheikh Khatri, Sheikh Khatri is their half-brother. And uh, same father, different mothers. And Sheikh Muhammad Ahmed was one of the foremost 
Quran teachers in the mountain region of Taganit. And he taught Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali not only was proficient in the um, in the um, uh, in the in, in Quran and tahfil of of and uh, in, in, in uh, teaching children, he also knew the times without even having a watch. If you asked him, Muhammad Ali, what what day is it today? He would say, on the Hijri calendar, it's this. On the Christian calendar, it's this. On this other calendar, it's this. And we're in the, the such and such star rises tonight. And the such and such star sets tonight. And this is where the winds come from. And this is when the third of the night is. And this is when the sixth of the night is. Like he was a mu'aqqat in every sense of the word. And he would sit at the masjid watching the dhil, counting it out by feet, which you won't find that in most of the Muslim world, that somebody knows how to find Buhur and the other prayers by the shadows and actually does that to establish the prayer in the masjid. Um, and so once his adhan, once he would give his adhan for the sudus or the or subah or dhuhr, you would see Murabit al-Hajj walk and go. Like he was Murabit al-Hajj's mu'adhan. Even though in the Maliki school, multiple people can give adhans. So you would hear at that at the Tuimrat masjid or any Mahdara masjid, you would hear, 15, 20 adhans, sometimes multiple ones at the same time, which people, one masjid, because it's sunnah to have the adhan, but you can have multiple, so anybody walking up to the masjid could give adhan. I'm sure Sheikh Hamza, did you, did you do that when you, when you were there? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's beautiful to be able to feel empowered to walk up to a masjid and just give the adhan and everybody, you know, you hear multiple adhans. Um, except for Maghrib. Maghrib is the only one you do one adhan. So, but the adhan that Murabat al-Hajj would walk to the masjid is Muhammad Ali's adhan. And I went there, you know, after Murabat al-Hajj passed away and I noticed Muhammad Ali doesn't give adhan anymore. So one day I went to him and I asked Muhammad Ali, I said, uh, Muhammad Ali, why don't you give the adhan anymore? And he was sitting with his, like in the, the uh, um, with his hands around his, um, his, his knees, sitting at the masjid. His son became the mu'adhan of the masjid. But Muhammad Ali just said, mm, I don't know. So I said, when I know there's a story and I know some people will question its authenticity and its level of, of, of whether it's sahih or not, or if it's da'if narration, but that Bilal radiallahu anhu stopped giving his adhan after the message, uh, messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away because it was just so sad. It was so um, it remind whenever he would give the adhan, you know, for him it was like adhan Rasulullah. It was he was waking up the Messenger of Allah. He was giving the adhan, and people in Medina knew if Bilal gives the adhan, now you see um, uh, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So I said, Muhammad Ali, just like Bilal, radiallahu anhu, stopped giving adhan when the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, passed away, is the same. Is that the same for you? Murabat al Hajj still had not passed away, but he wasn't praying in the Masjid anymore because of. Of, of, of illness and so there there was no longer that that portion of the adhan of like he gives the adhan and and murabat al-hajj walks and so i said is that the same for you and he said yeah that's the same for me so you can see elements of medina elements of the sahaba around the ulama and so if you know umar radiallahu and whose position with the messenger of allah that's haddamin that steadfastness just like umar is like i'm a kafir 100 percent he goes to his, his sister fatima's house Here's Taha, and then he, he declares his shahada at the mess with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "Now I'm a I'm I'm a Muslim 100, and we're going to worship at the Kaaba." And from then on, we know the stories of Umar. That's Haddamin. He didn't care who it was. One time, the president of Mauritania had come to visit in this nearby village, and somebody said he watched that. And he said the president just had his hand like this, and he was looking down like humbly, and Haddamin was just giving him advice. You have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this. And I've seen him one time when uh, when one of the the the, the great ulama um, currently one of the foremost ulama came to visit Mauritania, but it was said about him that he had taken on some of the um, the anthropomorphist aqida, like the aqida that's that's followed by the um, you know by whatever name they want to call themselves. It used they used to refer themselves proudly as Salafis. Now they're like, well, not Salafis, we're Afaris. Whatever you call yourselves, that anthropomorphist aqidah, Haddamin was 100% against it, and he had no qualms about it. All of those shiyukh that 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 stood there up there, he would literally say, "Tu bihim, ajhal min himar, more ignorant than donkey." Like all of these, like, and so if you got around Haddamin. You realize that Ahl he said, he said, we're the real Salafis, Rami. He said, we're the real Salafis. 
the aqidah that we have of the ashairah this is the aqidah of the salaf and so we are the salafis and so even students who were of that um, um of that thinking they would not study with haddamin because they knew haddamin's not going to cut any corners that's one thing that he fought hard against he would say that's fist don't pray behind them don't uh, take them as imams don't take them as your teachers that like he was he didn't have any mujamala when it came to the mujassima none whatsoever so and and other issues as well like uh, like uh, Sheikh hamza was mentioning you know that um he has all these position you know positions offered to him um and things but he doesn't take those he wants to humbly just teach and have no um no restrictions uh, he to, to be able to say what he wanted to say um another thing that that one time he asked me even with, oh, with all of this he also he wanted khumul and he one time uh, which is not being known so he asked me one time he said you know a lot of people in the west they know the name of murab al-hajj they know his story that's why we went there we went there because of the story of murab al-hajj um, he says, do the people know me? I said, not really, Sheikh. And I was embarrassed answering, saying, people don't really know your name. In fact, even now, if you look, the, the social media uh, reactions to the passing of Haddamin, it's different than Murabat al-Hajj. It's even different than Murabat Ahmed Fal. You see that. And, and so even in his passing, even with the age of social media, people, he's still kind of like, He's not center stage. So he asked me, he said, do people know me? And I, I was embarrassed saying, not really, Sheikh. He said, Alhamdulillah. And it was a sincere hamd. He said, I have asked Allah for khumul, for people not to know me. And then he told me uh, a, a, a saying, he said, Al um, ni'mah wa kullu nasi ta'ba. Like being unknown is a blessing and everybody refuses that. Wa dhuhuru ni'mah. And being known and being uh, in front of everybody is actually what's the best translation for a niqmah? The opposite of a niqmah is a is an anti blessing, and it's a tribulation, and everybody seeks it. So um, he was he was very steadfast. He was an amazing teacher. Like he taught us how. What you were talking, Sheikh Hamza, you were talking about Hajj, and I learned Hajj from Haddamin in the masjid and Safa and Marwa. He would make in the sand. He made the hills of Safa and Marwa and he broke off twigs. And I still remember it to this day to conceptualize what the Sa'i looked like. He said, he said, you stand here, here's one waqfa, and then you walk here, and here's here's the wadi nar, and here's this way you do this, and then you have a waqfa here. And then he went back and forth. He didn't even skip. He made he made seven lines in the sand. He had the two uh, hills of the sand, and he had four sticks on each of the sand. And he said, Do you understand it now? And I said, Yes, Sheikh, it's clear. Like from that point on, I I don't need a visualization better than that. One time I was studying with him and there's a hadith that talks about a qatib, a certain type of camel saddle. And he said, just wait right here. And he walked around to the side of his house. Actually, he said, come with me. And so we went over there and, and he dug around in the in the in the um, the area where they had all the camel saddles. And I was familiar with the cattle saddle, saddle that looks like, you know, like the Quran rahila. You know, it's like crossed like that. And they put the, but there's this other time called the qatib. He pulled it out. He says, Like that's mentioned in the hadith. So you can see things that are mentioned in the hadith that are still live. But he would take the time to show you these things. Um, and, and you know, in, in also to follow what uh, Sheikh Hamza was mentioning about his level of ilm. There's a very famous, you know, a lot of people now, if they hear Mauritania, they hear Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya. And he's definitely has a lot of ilm. But there's also a lot of ulama in Mauritania. It's not just like some people, unfortunately, think that Mauritania is just Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya. And that's not the case. There's a lot of heavy hitters. There's all star teams in the Badia. And so one time Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya was in Nawakshah and Haddamin happened to be there. And so he presented him with one of his books. He said, could you take a look at that? Haddamin just, he flipped through the, he said just the first few pages and he started pointing out things. And Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayah said, MashaAllah, you uh, ulama of Taganit are so um, high in your understanding of this deen. SubhanAllah. I, I just, you know, um, the, I was going to maybe come on to that point even. So you said in Mauritania, you think Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayah, but then even, you know, Sheikh, uh, one of the most famous Mauritanian scholars is arguably Sheikh Didu, Shanqiti. I will do that, though, yeah. Did he have any relationship with the scholars of uh, like Murabit al-Hajj, Murabit al-Hajj, Murabit al-Hajj, Murabit al-Hajj, Murabit al-Hajj, 
Well, he's from the the same clan, the Masuma clan, and I I've, I was actually there one time where he came to visit, and this is a, an a, an example. Of, he didn't study there. He studied with his uh, his akhwa like um, Sheikh Mohammed Al Hassan, will, um, Sheikh um, Abdul Wadud, will Abdul Wadud, um, and and in their mahdaras in the in the in Western Mauritania. But I was there one time around 2000 2001 where he came to visit, and mashallah, Sheikh Mohammed Al Hassan is very respectful of the ulama. Um, but I, 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 I have this image clearly. Haddamin was on the side of the tent, and even though he was waiting, he didn't wait for Sheikh Muhammad al-Hassan to come to visit him. He stood there, and I remember exactly how he was sitting, and he was watching Sheikh Muhammad al-Hassan as he was visiting with Murabat al-Hajj, and it was, wallah al-Azim, the image that I got of was like a tiger, just standing there, just waiting for his moment. And then when uh because sometimes those visits happen very quick they come they visit murabat al-hajj there and they're four by four they get and they go back so haddami was and he had his students with him because he was always teaching if he was milking the cows he was teaching same as murabat al-hajj same as the other teachers if he's walking his his calves out to pasture he's teaching if he's fixing something around his house he's teaching any state so he's sitting there and then afterwards he has a private conversation with muhammad al-hassan with the and later we asked him, you know, what was it that you were speaking of? He said, I asked him to make sure that he was still on the path of his forefathers. Because I had heard that in terms of Aqidah, that he was straying from what his forefathers were on. And I wanted to make sure that he was still on, you know, in Salafi terms, still on the Minhaj. Was he still on the Minhaj? He gave a Mujamara response at that time. And, you know, um, uh, his uncle... Uh, Wild uh, Abdul Wadud, Wild Adud has a, a versification of, of Khalil, of the Mukhtasar of Khalil, and it's like 13,000 line poem or something. And Khalil does not have an introduction in Aqidah, but uh, uh, um, Wild Adud, when he did that, he added in, and that really insulted a lot of people. They're like, Khalil didn't put it in there, but you put it in there, and it's a very, you know, quote unquote, ethari Aqidah, so it's not Sarih Tajseem. But it's getting too close to the line of, and so Haddamin was like, he was always adamantly speaking about that, that that was wrong, that was wrongly done, wrongly stated. Sheikh Muhammad al-Hassan um, has done a commentary of that. So it's it's best to see what a person themselves write about an issue. And so as you read it, uh, from my reading, Sheikh Muhammad al-Hassan, at, at least at the time of his pinning the commentary on his maternal uncle's um, uh, versification of Khalil with the intro on Aqidah, um, you know, it's uh, it's got some, you know, it, mm. it, it has it has criticisms of the Ashaira and them taking away the throne from the Rahman um, and that sort of language. But it's not as um, explicit Tajseem as like what the others. It's kind of like very. I asked one of the Mauritanian fuqaha. I said, would it be enough of this aqidah be enough of a bid'ah to where you would not pray behind him? He said, I don't know. He said it's it's not as clear as what would constitute for him at least for that uh, alim uh, to say that this because once you have tajseem it's fism and aqidah and according to the maliki school it's haram but a valid prayer to pray behind him Sheikh Hamza on I don't know if there's anything you want to not, not the specific point we just made about Sheikh Didu but before that anything Sheikh Rami mentioned if you come want to come on the back of that but I also well, well, one thing that's standing out now because when when Sheikh Hamza when you spoke about Sheikh Murabid Haddamin I had this image of this loving figure you know the you know like the, the hug of your teacher the warm embrace the comfort the protection to to be in his presence is to be loved and protected and then suddenly Sheikh Rami you know we saw the Jalal now that you presented this the tiger the lion this ferocious figure that will stand up for for the creed of Ahl Sunnah or Jama'ah I don't know if there's something you would want to add on that juxtaposition in the description of Murabid Haddamin that some people, you know, one might, it's not bipolar, but it's like this this duality that they're able to switch between when they need to. Even you mentioned, or I don't know who mentioned about he's playing with the children or he shouted and then he turned and suddenly he's all smiles again. I don't know if there's something you could add a reflection or something on, on the back of that. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see I don't see any um, tavad, any sort of like uh, uh, unharmonious uh, state between these two natures that's what a father is like you know your their father that's one of the reasons you feel safe with him is because you know he's a strong person he's a powerful person he's not down for nonsense if you listen to him good things happen if you don't listen 
you know, you're going to end up hurting yourself. Not that he's going to hurt you, that you're going to end up hurting yourself. So you best uh, listen to what he has to say. Um, and, you know, that's the proof that he wasn't just like a sectarian bigot who's going around trying to hack people down and score points. I think sometimes people confuse all of these things, you know, like they'll say, oh, so-and-so is like Sayyidina Omar. And really all they all they mean by that is they're just a nasty person who has bad akhlaq. And Sayyidina Omar, the Allah, whom himself wasn't like that. You know, he's the one who used to weep with the children of the shuhada. He's the one who cooked dinner for uh, the woman who didn't know who he was. And she was like stirring a pot of boiling water um, to put the kids to sleep. Um, you know, I had that mean he was like that. I don't see any, I don't see any, any tawad between that. He was such a soft person. He was such a sweet person. I remember during uh, 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 Dars, he would sift grain out of the sand. The grain would fall here and there. So he'd sift grain out of the sand with his fingers and feed like a, a baby lamb that happened to be around. And the lamb loved him. And, uh, uh, you know, and so it would like knock over the ink pot because it was clumsy because it's a baby. And uh, so eventually the solution was that they tied the chain, they chained the lamb uh, uh, and it could come close enough to sit right next to him. And then he put the ink pot on the other side so that, the you know, so as to not deprive the lamb uh, because the lamb wants to sit with Sheikh as well. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, you can't be knocking the, the ink pot over. Uh, but on the flip side, yeah, people who were doing sketchy things or people who did nonsense or people who crossed lines that shouldn't be crossed, uh, you know, he wasn't he wasn't OK with it. He wasn't down with it. And that's, uh, you know, that that's not the sign of like, you know, just being like a harsh person or whatever. It's look, it's it has to do with Allah Ta'ala, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, that of Allah Ta'ala. If somebody is going to say that it's like a like, you know, a, a, some person sitting in a chair in the sky. That should be really offensive to people, you know. And our husn of one of our brothers who say these things is that somehow or another they think that this is preserving the deen or whatever, even though it really isn't. Um, and you know, I'm not I'm not here to say anything bad about Sheikh Muhammad Salim Rahimahullah Taala or Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Wildadu. I really firmly believe that their uh, debates are outside of my pay grade and there are reasons people say things the way that they do. Some people are more explicit in things. Some people are a little bit more ambiguous in the things that they say. Uh, uh, but, but uh, you know, I can see, I can see why Haddamin without any disrespect to the, you know, to those two mashaykh, mashaykh, I can see why Haddamin was, would be upset about it. Uh, it's a fitna. It's a fitna for people to think, to think that and uh, uh, to think about, you know, this kind of anthropomorphist conception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and, you know, I don't see that as somehow being uh, against a person's, uh, you know, softness and kindness. Uh, and if those people showed up, it's not like he had, uh, <laughs> it's not like he like did an ambush and killed anybody or beat them up or jailed them or tortured them or whatever, you know, which is interestingly enough, uh, a tactic commonly used by many uh, sectarian uh, partisans. But, uh, you know, he had enough, uh, he had enough, uh, confidence in the ilm that uh you know he could stand his ground and you know that that's how I, that's how one how the how the ulama are supposed to be mm. no that's a very 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 beautifully put again um i don't know if either of one of you want to pick this up but maybe sheikh rami can start this one off this idea of the lamb being you know compassionate to the to the animals being compassionate to the children you mentioned i don't know we you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, he goes to study, he comes back, he's got this fascination with stars all of a sudden, and he talks about the desert in Mauritania, you can look at the sky, you can see the stars. This idea, even that the Messenger of Allah tells us near the end of times when the fitan increased, go to the mountains, go to these places, go with sheep, be with nature. It seems like this place was a place of fitrah, this place was a place of nature people in tune with their nature and had a beautiful relationship with the nature around them and i'd love to get some you know where we i'm in a room right now and i've got this screen and i've got this technology and all of these things and you're sitting in a car and, and sheikh's got an amazingly expensive probably microphone in front of him that in an age of technology what you know the significance of these people of nature well um you know, I, I like the, the story Sheikh Hamza shared about the uh, the lamb because that that compassion and that was the ghalid, the dominant with Haddamin. Like his his compassion outweighed. It's just and you, you see this in the seerah when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when a line was crossed, they could even see the vein in his head. 
that would you know become prominent and the redness in his face like there they had he had emotion but the the ghalib is this tarheed this welcoming this lovingness um with the children with the animals um feeding them making sure that everything had um enough food one time we were walking if you see old pictures of toimrat there's this very very large tree in mauritania Tanya, they call it the taydum if you look if you want any of the viewers because i know everybody's multitasking type in boabab tree b B O A B A B Boabab tree, and you see these massive trees that grow um, in in the in the in the the, the savanna type uh, environments of Africa, East Central West Africa. They get taller as you the far the farther you go east, like Somalia and, and Eritrea and those those areas. Mauritania, they're still very. I mean, they're they're wider than a car. They're as thick as like as big as a room as uh, around. And in the the early um, um, in the early 70s, there was this drought and famine that really devastated a lot of Mauritania that caused many of the people who lived that pastoral life to move to the cities. So Nawakshat, which was the cap, which is the capital city that was established only in the 60s, got this huge influx of Mauritania in 1970, 71, 72 because of this massive famine. Murabat al-Hajj, who lived his whole life in Taganit in the mountain region, other than the three-year round trip to Hajj by foot, he went down to Gero during that famine because the people, they couldn't depend on their animals or their small subsistence farming. Eventually he went back up into to the mountains. Um, but this tree, the Doom tree, the tree, um, they, they, they started cutting them down to feed the cows because you'll see the inside of the tree is very spongy. And you will even see some pictures on the internet where they're hollowed out and people go inside and get the honey from inside once the bees make hives inside of the trees. But this, um, they were they were really just wiping them out in Taganit. And Haddamin said, this is not right. And so look at this. He used the Sharia as an environmentalist to protect protect the last Taydum tree that was in that Tuimrat area. And so what he did is he used the hukum from Ihya al-Mawat, which is basically the rules of what I translated as the rooms of homesteading, where you go to a land that's unoccupied, unowned. How do you be, get Sharia ownership of that land? According to the Maliki school, you have to plant something there, but not only plant something, it has to be fenced in. So he built a fence around this Taydum tree and planted some beans or some, some plants, just nominal. So that by Sharia, now he owns that land and he owns that tree. And so when people were trying to cut down all the trees and they would come to Haddamin's tree, now he has a Sharia injunction. He's like, these aren't wild trees anymore. This is my private property. This yeah. I own this tree. And so people know Haddamin's Taydum tree. And it, I mean, it produced... All while we were there, when the leaves come, they take the leaves, they put it in the in their in their food, they take the fruit, they make this drink out of it. That's now I find it's very nutritious. You can get the boabab uh, tree fruit uh, powder. It's high in uh, uh, vitamin C and um, and and other uh, other nutrients. Um, and I remember one time in the pathway between his house and the masjid, a little uh, sprout had come up, and he went down on the ground and he smelled the leaves to like figure out. He says. Yes, he, I can tell by the smell that this is a Taydum tree. He said, but unfortunately, people walking back and forth, they're not going to allow it to be um, to, to, to live. And he said, and it's too young to transport. And so he planted in me like a lot of that love of the environment and care and thinking about the environment in addition to the um, to the animals. So that's like you can see that the Sharia goes beyond just um, beyond just teaching and a lesson and and something that's not uh, applicable like how do you take these books from our tradition and create a hukum that people would you know then you could create a protection additionally um one of the older the elder mauritanians in Twemrat, he told me he said he said you see that place where there it's been dug out on the side of the tree i said yeah he said somebody actually just went ahead and you know out, out of stubbornness said, i don't care if it's had that means tree i'm going to cut it because my cows need that food and so he cut a hole in that tree to start feeding his cows because they would eat all of the insides and then they're going to kill the tree um, he said, but Haddamin had made a dua to protect his tree. He said, and I saw the cows. Well, he didn't say I saw. He said that the, the cows came up. They sniffed it. And even though normally they would love to eat the inside spongy uh, uh, um, um, inner bark of the of the, of the Taydum tree, he said they sniffed it and they would walk away. He said that was Haddamin's dua. Um, 
in um, about the stars when I got there, I too had heard about, you know, the Mauritanians, you know, they know the, the, the stars and I found that. And then you go there and you see these clear skies. I mean, it's like, watch, it's like, it's clearer than being in a planetarium. You see the Milky Way every night, you see meteor showers, you see all, I mean, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, not to, not to especially in the winter. I mean, that was the first time I realized you, you actually have a shadow in the moonlight. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah, and and some people can actually read their loh by the moonlight. It's that bright. So, uh, so I I had a you know the uh, Qamus, uh one of these dictionaries that that had in the in the in the middle you know some of those Arab dictionaries Arabic dictionaries they would have like drawings, and so I found a drawing of the constellations, and then I found a book that listed out all of their names the 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 manazil of the qamar the constellations. Basically, now I know the term is the lunar zodiac. So I found all of the names and I, I had gone to Muhammad Ali, but he's so quick. He's like, and there's a Dabaran and there's a Rayyad. And I'm like, I, I can't do this. I need something a little bit slower. So I walked up to Haddamin and this is on the weekend. The weekend is from Wednesday midday to Friday midday. Does he, does he um, teach I walked to him. Uh, what's that? Does he, does he teach? Would he teach on the weekends as well? I mean, or is, is that just that sounds oh, yeah. Good. If you came to Haddamin at any time, any time, Jum'a. Morning, noon, or night. Even if he's sitting with a, a, a Jum'ah, even if he's sitting with his family, if he sees a student arrive, he and I feel bad that I went there sometimes on the weekend. And now looking back, I said, you know, he's teaching from before Fajr till after Isha during the week. At least let the, the weekend with his family. But I would walk there sometimes on the weekend and he would leave sitting with his family co to come teach us. Um, which now I, in hindsight, it was bad adab on my part to do that. Um, but I walked up to him after Asad in the masjid and I handed him, or I had this list. I said, I have a list of the 28 manazin. Could you write them into a poem for me? And he said, yeah, sure. No problem. And I handed him the list. He said, you don't need, I, I said, I don't need the paper. I know them. By Maghrib time, he had come up with a, with a, with the poem that he had written out that lists out the, the 28, um, lunar mansions, the, the manazin. Um, and then I, I memorized it and I studied it with him and that gave me the, the basis to know how to make sense of the sky. SubhanAllah. Sheikh Hamza, and then both of you again, I mean, unless, Sheikh Hamza, do you want to add anything to that about this idea of nature and being in Mauritania and with the Mashaif? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, that to be, to kind of go slightly off topic, but only slightly, one of the things about being in Mauritania is it kind of told us how to, or it showed us how like normal people are connect with nature because I think part of the sitting inside houses with ACs and heaters and things like that, um, it romanticizes a lot of these things. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very real when you're sitting in the, in the sand and the roth and the heat and whatnot. Uh, the animals are not as cute anymore. Uh, and the silly things they do uh, sometimes are can be very painful. Uh, one of our uh, common friends, Sheikh Murabit, who is in Harlem right now, uh, Murabit Benavides, uh, uh, you know, I remember once he came to his tent, he, someone, one of the Tunisi students had brought dates and he gave Murabit some of them. And, uh, you know, you're not, you're not feasting, you know, at your local halal restaurant out in the desert. You know, sometimes maybe a day goes by, you don't eat or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and you definitely don't, don't, don't dig in on a regular basis. Um, and so he, he was saving those dates. And when he came, when he got to his tent, a donkey had like broken into his tent and started eating the dates. And there was just thick globs of donkey slobber all over them. Even the ones that, he, by the time he pushed it out, like even the ones that were, were uh, you know, not eaten yet, were just kind of like unedible, perhaps, uh, you know, not, just not edible because of all of this uh, slobber. And uh, a person can get really frustrated and get really hard-hearted. And it's not like every Mauritanian is a tree hug hugger. You know, I don't want people to idealize it. When you go there, you will see there's, you know, it's a country like other country, and there are people like other people, mashallah. And there's all sorts of stuff that you'll 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 see. In general, we we try to mention the good about all people, especially a qom that accepted us and that we received ihsan from. There's no point or reason to badmouth, but it's not like this automatic thing. And uh, if you try being, if you try 
engaging with nature, like with this kind of fake, like magic Disney uh, uh, princess castle, like type idea that somehow like I pray my five daily prayers. And so all the, the animals are going to dance around me in a circle. It doesn't really work that way. Um, it doesn't really work that way. And so that's what makes it all the more uh, incredible that, you know, those people who didn't have like an AC uh, unit closed off room that they could retreat to, that they still have that type of softness and kindness. Um, you know, it, it tells you something about them because it, it grates on you uh, very hard and, and very quickly uh, in a way that uh, you can't really fake uh, afterward. SubhanAllah. I, I, Shia Hamza, it's been a while since I've heard your turn of phrase, and, and as always, it's very poetic. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I want to move on because I know, Sheikh Rami, you're going to have to leave in, in the next 20 minutes, I think. Um, but and, and then talk about the future and, and the idea of, of, of reviving tradition and how can we take the idea, uh, the, the, the characteristic of Sheikh Muhammad Hadamin and, and all of these great Mashaykh and Mauritania in, in our own lives and the communities that we, we, we live in. And, but before I do that, I just hope maybe if one of you could just describe him, what, what did he look like? Because I tried to look for pictures and, and it's very, you can find pictures of Murabit al-Hajj because Peter Sanders had a very nice camera when he was there. And I think more Rabbi Ahmed Fahd, there are videos and things of him. If I if I share some pictures of you for, for you by WhatsApp, would you would you be able to share them? Maybe. Okay, I, I can take them and then. Well, and then, I'll just send it to you, and um, you can put it online. One of the reasons why he there's not many pictures is he actually did not want pictures taken of him. He hated he hated pictures, okay. and uh, that's part of his humul, his wanting to be unknown. But any pictures that are available, they were all taken without his permission. And in the first few years, people who had those pictures, they held on to them because they, they didn't want his family to be, uh, even like Muhammad Haddam, Sheikh Muhammad Haddamin in the Emirates, um, he would actually ask me, he says, if you know the person who has such and such website, ask them to remove those pictures. So his family were very, um, even Murabat al-Hajj as well, their family didn't like um, um, all of this, you know, um, um, advertising of, 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 of the pictures. Um, and so there's not that many pictures of Haddami, but I can share some with you. Um, uh, but so I don't know how to describe him other than he one time described to me when he was telling me about the, the hair of Musa alayhi salam, he said, what's mentioned in the narrations is that he had thick, coarse hair. And then Haddami grabbed his hair and he said, like my hair. Mm -hmm. So he had very thick, coarse hair um, and um, uh, uh, a um, golden tone to his skin. I mean, he was for he was very handsome, mashallah. You know, in addition to his ilm and his thabat and his salah, you know, when you looked at it, when you saw him, you were to me, it's like you're looking at a rajul. This is a man. And in this age of all this effeminity of effeminization of men and this question of gender and so forth, we need some role models of like men. And I remember one time. Somebody had come to Mauritania and they said that um, um, they said there was a, a, a story of, of one of the ulama who lived in, in one of the cities. And there was a woman who never wore hijab. But one one day she put on her hijab and then she took it off. And they said, why did you take it off? She said, because I'm supposed to wear my hijab in front of uh, of men and none of you are men. And then this alim came to town. I can't remember who it was. And he's a real man. So I put my hijab on because of him. Now, that's not valid reasoning, but it tells you something about Ulama have to be men in manly at all, you know, level. Haddamin um, had a large family. Um, he had children even well into his 60s. He had, you know, while he has children who are um, in their 30s, he also has like little infants running around. So we, I got to see him, this grandfather figure taking care of his, you know, advising his teenage and adult sons and children, taking care of his own infant children taking care of his grandchildren, they would all um, uh, be around him. Um, but in terms of describing his physical description, that's, uh, I think the picture's worth a thousand words if I can share it. So you said he had little children. Was he, what, did he have children at a late age as well? Because that's, that's a masculine vigor there for sure. Yeah, he did. Well, he also, he had his first wife who was a Sharifa from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who's the mother of Sheikh Mohammed uh, al in the Emirates, who many people in the UK uh, know him. He's visited there a few times. By the um, way, I, WhatsApp, I, I have sure. the admin uh, team ready that they can share them. When you're I'll ready. send it to you. Um, 
and then his second son, uh, Dahan. And then after she passed away, um, and it was very hard on him um, after she passed away, and, and the mortality rates amongst women in the Badia are high, women and children. Um, and so you find many people who their first wife passed away. Murabat Ahmed Fal, his first, his wife, who's the daughter of Murabat Al Hajj, she passed away in childbirth. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah Al Ahmed, his first wife passed away, uh, also I believe in childbirth. Um, Haddamin's first wife passed away. He married a second time, and then most of his younger children, um, well, they're 40 years all the way down to I think his youngest is probably about 20 years old. Um, well, while we get some of the pictures and, and we're going to try and put them up, inshallah, um, maybe just to try and take this conversation to to looking at the future. Um, you know, Sheikh Hamza, you're doing, alhamdulillah, with the Imam Ghazali Institute, this this idea of carrying on the tradition, you're, you're working to continue this tradition. You spoke about the idealization of what it was to be in Mauritania. What, what what lessons do you think we can take from the idea of this mahtara, of the way of Murabit al-Hajj, of Murabit Ahmed Fal and Murabit al-Dameen living here in the West? And I don't know if there was any specific advice he gave you when you before you left for America or, or for how to function for your own community over here. You know, I think a couple of things come to mind. One is that uh, Mauritania is a very different society than... Uh, than, than the one that we live in in uh, uh, in America uh, or in uh, perhaps uh, in Europe. I think the two of those are also very different from one another. I never really got the idea of you have to do this or you have to do that. Maybe Sheikh Rami has better uh, uh, advice that he can uh, uh, that he can give uh, and relate uh, from the Mashaikh. But uh, you know the idea uh, the idea was always that. They prepared us, and that we're going to have to go and struggle with, you know, the the issues of uh, our home. What I would say that that we did inherit from them was the value of this knowledge, and the value of studying it, the value of teaching it. Which, to be very frank with you, it's 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 a civilizational value that we seem to uh, not have, um, and it was something that they embodied, but it was far from unique to them alone. Uh, wherever you go in the Sharq or in the Gharb, uh, in whatever era of Islamic history that you read, uh, you will see that the kings and princes fought for thrones. But once they were secure, the, the treasures that Allah Ta'ala put at their hands, they knew nothing better to do with those treasures than to sponsor the study and teach, uh, teaching of knowledge and to themselves engage in it and to have their own progeny uh, engage in it. So it was not unknown, you know, from the uh, Banu Umayyah's Khulafa uh, in Andalus, you know, the, the grandson of Timur Lung himself. Timur Lung is like the quintessential homicidal Tur turco mongolic like killer, um, you know, pyramid of skulls type dude. His grandson, uh, Ulugbek, who was essentially the the first substantial ruler after him, uh, in my opinion, he built one of the most beautiful madars in the world, in which Ilmo studied. You know, they, it was it was a premier astronomical observatory, but that doesn't mean that they, you know, that, that it wasn't a traditional madrasa where the Book of Allah and the the Sunnah of the Prophet fiqh, aqidah, all of these things were were not studied in depth, and there was seen as you know no separation between between all of these things, the fascination with the world around you and the order of the universe, how things are supposed to be. Uh, and as uh, time, as time, we're losing, we're losing connection to that knowledge, which is like the life of a person's heart and the life of a person's mind. And we're substituting knowledge for degrees. I mean, Mauritania, there's no degrees. The ijazah that they would give was the ijazah of Quran, uh, primarily. The rest of it, study it and understand it. What's the point of paperwork, you know? Uh, uh, because some people, they graduate from Madaris. Sadly, maybe I'm one of them. They graduate from Madaris with a piece of paper. And what does it mean, you know? It's like I tell my, my son takes like martial arts. He says, oh, Baba, we're going to get this belt and this stripe and this, 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 that. I said, but when the fight happens, the color of your belt means nothing. If you can't defend yourself, you, it's, it's, all, it's all vanity. 
Um, um, and so, and so that attitude about it, it was love for knowledge for its own sake. There's no graduation. There's no uh, degrees. There's not Fulan is a sheikh. Fulan isn't. How do you become a sheikh in Mauritania? I say you just keep learning. And when everybody who's better to study with uh, than you is dead, then you know people will come to you out of a necessity, not as a, as a, a goal. And so Sheikh Rami will tell you about those people, mashallah, whose beards have become completely white and. Uh, you know, they spent their whole life and they continue spending their life studying, studying, studying. And that when you have people like that uh, in the ummah, uh, great khair happens. And when you have people who, I guess, appropriate the, 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 the title of a, a, a scholar without having the osaf, the, the descriptions of a scholar in them, uh, then, you know, all sorts of fun and games happen as we all are, are, are aware of and have seen. Uh, in our lives uh, as well. I, I had a question, and I don't know. I don't think we have time to go into this. I, I just thought of this as an interesting idea. Is is the and, and I want to get maybe before Sheikh Rami if you, before you need to go as well. I, I just asked Sheikh Hamza about you know reflections on how can we take what what is in Mauritania with the Morabitun, their tradition and and ways to implement or what is there that we can take from them as lessons for living in the West and maybe any advice the Mashaykh gave. Another thing, I don't know if you can quickly reflect on this, and if not, then maybe once you go, Sheikh Hamza can add some notes on this, is um, the, the type of tasawwuf they practiced, which is not tariqa-based tasawwuf from what I understand, the Zaruqi method of non-institutionalized tasawwuf in a sense, but through the writings of Sidi Ahmed Zaruq. And also, I've always been intrigued by the fact that they were so distant, maybe, in one sense, from the rest of the Ummah, of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So did they have, one of the things Sheikh Hamza Yusuf mentions about Rabbat al-Hajj is, he went on Hajj and he heard the announcement that the Khilafah had fallen. So this idea that, you know, what was their relationship with the rest of the Ummah? And maybe even like you talked about the Prime Minister came, what was their reflection on, on politics? Like, what did, what did politics mean to them? I don't know if you have time to maybe reflect on this. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll give yeah. you a way to, to finish uh, on. <laughs> can you hear me okay? I had to leave and come back. Yeah, we can hear you perfectly, sure. Okay. Um, I'll start with the first one, which is the advice that they would give. And Sheikh Hamza talked, uh, touched upon this earlier when he was speaking about, you know, whatever we're involved in, they were a safety net for us. And that's the same feeling that I had. Like, no matter if I was just, you know, acting a fool, wasting my time, always in the back of my mind, one of the things that like helped ground me was I, I could say, I at least I know how that means not messing around. I know he's taking care of his time. He's teaching. He's in ibadah. He's solving people's problems. He's helping people. He's doing his herd of animals. Um, had the the animals of many widows and orphans. He would he he took in orphans as well. He was taking care of uh, widows and orphans. So in addition to their teaching, they're also doing this community service of just like the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would walk with the ma'al miskini wal armala. He would walk with the widow and walk with the poor. That was haddamin. Uh, but at at the core, his message that he really put into my heart and the hearts of many is teaching. And that was the same for all of the other te the teachers. Uh, uh, Murabat al-Hajj's uh, children, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Sheikh Tahir, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, uh, Murabat Ahmed Fal, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, uh, Murabat Haddamin. They would ask us, are you teaching? Are you teaching others? And that would give them the greatest joy. You know, people would come in with, with, with gifts and with assistance and so forth. But for them, the greatest gift was knowing that their students are teaching other people. And even for me, my one of the things that helped me process his death and his passing, because I wasn't over there, and you know, sometimes the emotion and nostalgia would like, oh, I wish I could be there right now. But the reality is you can be with them wherever you are if you're carrying on what made them proud. And what he wanted to do, just as Sheikh Hamza was saying, that he had the telegram group, all these groups don't have access to their um, to their uh, to to their their Hajj guides that they could ans ask the questions in person, and so he opens up the telegram, and so that's living the legacy of Haddamin. What Karima Foundation is doing, you know, you're you're living the legacy of Haddamin. The 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 encouragement to study the poems of of Sheikh Muhammad Maulud came to me from Haddamin. He's the one who would anybody who studied with Haddamin. Uh, you know, once they got into the regular flow of their studies, it, he would say, especially for those of us coming from the West, use the, the weekdays, um, Friday to Wednesday, to study your main text. 
and then use the weekends to study the line, the books of Muhammad Maulud. And so for me, it was Maharam al Lisan, and then he went to the next one, and then I studied many with Haddamin, and I benefited so much. That's when I translated them and started teaching them to other people. Um, but one thing I do, I do find that that is missing is that a lot of people who might they have to be coupled with the study of aqidah and fiqh. You're not going to understand them and really get the benefit um, primarily for, for, uh, just by studying them as standalone texts. Um, but that's carrying on his tradition, teaching that I do. I know that I'm honoring Haddamin when I teach, you know, when I continue to teach and wherever that might be. And the, did, the, the, did, he know, did, he, did he know about the Taiba Foundation and, and what yes, was the role yeah. of from that? Yeah, he, he, he knew. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I found, and I think this is humbling for the Mauritanians, they weren't like, they weren't very, you bring them news, it wasn't like, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, oh, subhanAllah, mashallah. They're not into a lot of mujamalat. They're not into like a lot of praise. They would just be proud and just say, oh, mashallah. And then they turn to their student, mashallah, you know, you know, uh, start, continue your lesson. Um, and so you're not going to get, you're not going to distract them from um, from what they're doing even with political conversations, I mean, people would bring up politics, whether it was world politics. Uh, we were there when nine, we were in Mauritania when 9-11 happened. So that thrust everybody's conversations into politics. There's Mauritanian politics. They, we were there during a couple of the coups. Um, and so politics is always there. And so he would entertain it for a certain extent and give some thoughts. But just after, as students try to push the conversation in that direction, he just turns, he's like, <laughs> continue, you know, continue your law. And that's that's like the the that's the cadence and the meter that you need. That no matter you know, they they also don't do um, speeches. They don't do speeches. So I know had that mean you know if we, if I told him I was on a uh, giving a thousand speeches a year, he's like, but do you have students? Are you teaching? You know. Um, so that's how you can you know we can carry on their 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 legacy. One thing I wanted to share because I know I'm going to have to to leave uh, is that. Um, when you sent me the flyer about this program to commemorate Haddamin, it had pictures of the stars. And it was something about, you know, memories from the desert. And somebody might think, well, why don't you use a picture of the desert? And it was interesting that you used a picture of the stars because the condolence that I was giving to people um, on the passing of, of, um, of Haddamin was a line from something that Ka'ab al-Ahbar radiallahu anhu said about the death of a scholar. He says, Mawtul alim najmun tumisa. The death of a scholar is a star that has gone out. And I got the news like at 12. It was noon. It was just a few minutes after he had passed away. And I, I got the news and I was in the process of, I was getting my kids ready. We were going to a science museum and they have a planetarium there. And so I'm having to like process the death of my teacher and going through the motions of, you know, taking the kids to this, this museum and, um, at giving condolences and passing, you know, the people were trying to check on the news, make sure it wasn't it wasn't fake news. Um, and when I sat in the, the we, we did this planetarium for kids. And when I sat on the planetarium, one of the first things they did or he said, and it really it really resonated with me, was that he said, when 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 the sun comes up and the, you, you don't see the rest of the stars, he said, just because you don't see them, they're still shining just as bright. Oh. They're still shining just as bright. And so it doesn't negate what Ka'b al-Ahbar says. It's Najmun Tumisa. Tumisa in terms of our view. We don't see it anymore. We don't see Haddamin there. We don't hear his adhan. We don't hear his qira'ah of Quran, which I have some audios that somebody shared with me. I can share with you his uh, a lesson that he gave and some audios. And Sheikh Hamza, you know, um, again, my condolences to you as a, as a fellow student of Murabat Haddamin, and I'll share those audios that were shared with me. You may have already got them, but it's good to hear the voice of your loved one even after they've they've passed away. And that's one of the benefits of the digital age um, with all the other fitan that it brings. Um, but just because we don't see the star doesn't mean that they're not there. And for anybody who might think, oh, I never got to visit Murabat al-Hajj or Murabat Ahmed Fad or Murabat Haddamin, they're still there. That's why Ziyaratul Awliya, even in the Maqabir, is so important. Even in the graveyards is so important because it also shows how to get over the hurdles of making a ziyara when the person's alive. Oh, they're alive, we'll go see them. Brave, they have a different level that weren't there during their life. So they're still shining just as bright. SubhanAllah. That day and, and, and you have things on your schedule. 
Um, I, I want to maybe emotionally as well to share these reflections on the passing of somebody so dear to yourself forever and hopefully inshallah ta'ala, Allah ta'ala reward him and make his grave a garden from the garden. It's an actionable item for all of those who who are listening to this live or this recording and they say, okay, I never knew, hear us say Haddamin and they think, oh, you're not saying Sheikh Haddamin. He actually didn't. But if it, as a title of respect, Murabat is, is what they, they're, they're, they're more um, comfortable with. Um, but if somebody says like, but he says in a hadith, narrated by a shi'bi on uh, the authority of Ibn, that the, the Quranic recitation was Surah Al-Duha because one of the images of Haddami and Ahmed Fal is that they stay and then they make their Salat Al-Duha um, and so Haddami said never pray Salat Al-Duha for three days um, and also uh, fast three days from every month um, and also praise the you're on a tra- whether you're traveling um, uh, in your residence and he says, and he said, this is mentioned, كَمَا عَزَاهُ الْقُرْطُبِ فَالْتَذْكِرَةً This is mentioned by الْقُرْطُبِ in صَدِّقًا وَانْظُرًا um, to, um, So th- these three things, Salat al-Duha, fasting three days, and I'll end with that. Zakum Allah khairan for the, uh, for the invitation, um, and, and keep us in the in the khidmah, in the service of ilm and the ulama, wherever they might be, al-ahya wal-amwat, the living and the dead, and make us in the service of the ulama and also of their children. Um, the ulama of their the the in the service of their their children and the ta'alim of muta'allam that honoring a scholar's children and their children's children is actually more beloved is more adab than than honoring the scholar themselves i mean ya rabbi alamin may allah put us in their service i mean ya rabbi alamin well, i'll finish with one question with you to to you sheikh hamza now just to, just to take it to a close you went to Uzbekistan not long ago. You spent time there. You visited, I'm assuming, the grave of Bahaudin Qulal. I This is the tariqa of my, my mashaykh as well. And so this place is very blessed for, for me historically um, as well. And then you're going to Bosnia soon, uh, the Ghazi Husrabe Masjid and the Mostar Bridge and all of this idea of history and tradition. We've spent time, we've talked about the Murabit. What is, I, I think, this idea of, like Sheikh Ami mentioned, of traversing the footsteps, recognizing the existence. Why is it so important for us as Muslims in the modern age to reconnect with this idea of tradition, walk the footsteps, to be in the places where they once were? He talked about visiting the graves, to take blessings from them, even after their passing. Well, how can we do that? What, what, and, and, and why is this? So, you know, this is, a, I guess, a, a kind of a, a topic that maybe people maybe it would be good for a, a separate discussion. 100%. But uh, the idea is that uh, the body may die, but the ruh never dies. And so a person has connection with people, whether they're living or whether they've passed, uh, that is spiritual. And that spiritual connection is something that isn't intuitive how it happens in time and space like physical connections happen. And by the baraka of having love, uh, a, a person can traverse a number of journeys that are otherwise impossible to traverse. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said on a number of occasions in the Sahihain, it's narrated, it's one of the most authentic of, of things that he said, and he said it more than once, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Al-mar'u ma'aman ahabba. Uh, that a person will be with the one that they love. In particular, the context of it in both times has to do with trying to bridge a gap between oneself and somebody who is at an unattainably higher station than them. That the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a person will be with the one that they love. And so this is something that I saw uh, and I heard from my own mashayikh, both in the Sharq and in the Gharb, that that this mahabba was something sacred and it's something to hold on to because without it, uh, these journeys were not not really possible to, uh, to traverse. And part of that mahabba, because it's a ruh that itself needs a body to be manifested. And you have to show your love somehow. A dog shows his love in a certain way. Uh, a, a cat shows its love in a different way. A human being also has to have a way of showing love. You can't just live inside of your head. You actually have to you know, do physical things sometimes. Um, uh, that's why the, the salah is legislated that's why hajj is legislated the siyam etc etc wala dhikrullahi akbar the greatest one of the many tafasir of this the, uh, these words of the book of allah ta'ala is that the the greatest component of all of these things is the remember, remembrance of allah ta'ala and the extolling the praise of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but it, 
having a medium to carry that that spirit is very important. And so having nisbah with the Ahlullah, listening to them, listening to stories about them, meeting them when you're able to. This is one thing that was perhaps not mentioned that, that should be mentioned. Masha Tuimarat still, you can go and learn your Fardain there. You can still learn from Alif Batatha all the way through the advanced books. You can still go there. Murabit Ahmed Fa'al's grand, uh, son, uh, uh, who, was, you know, who was our teacher, we would go and read Dars with him as well. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah, Murab al Hajj's son, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, you know, these are still great figures uh, that deserve mention. You know, we shouldn't just wait until someone passes away and then have a, you know, like a, a wake for them or whatever. Uh, they're still there. You can go still study with them. You can go still experience the same Mauritania. Oh, it's changed. Okay, it's changed, but it's also still there. And, uh, uh, you know, the, there's still khair and barakah in the ummah in the east and in the west. You can still go and meet people. If you can't meet the people that have passed away, you can still meet the people who are alive. You can have these transformative experiences. They may not be the same as they were last time, but they'll be different. They'll be what Allah Ta'ala made for you. If your intention is pure and you're sincere and the love is there in the heart, he'll, he'll tailor it for you maybe as an experience that, that is more appropriate than what people in the past had. So people should make effort, get up, get out of their houses and go. Uh, 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 but, you know, coming back to the idea of nisbah, that, that expressing that nisbah and giving people an opportunity to have that spiritual connection with the great people of this ummah um, and to make dua for them and to visit them and to remember them so that when you meet on the day of judgment, uh, you're not strangers from one another spiritually, even though you may have been strangers from one another physically. That's very important. And this is one of the things I say to people. I say, make dua for Murabit al-Hajj, for Haddamin, for any of our mashaykh, the great mashaykh that passed away, whether they're from Mauritania or, or, or not. Um, most people, when you make dua for them, the ghalib al-imkan, the, 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 the preponderant probability is what? Is that your dua is going to benefit them at a time that they need it. And all of us need it, of course. There are some people, a person gets the idea that the one making the dua will actually benefit more than the one receiving it. Why? Because you look at their lives, you see that their accounts, they left this world with their accounts in order with a very uh, large balance in their favor. And you think about the hadith of mar'uma aman ahabba, that a person will be with the one that they love, that you love somebody, you make dua for them. That a person gets the idea that the hadith of the Prophet wasallam is that when you make dua for somebody, the angel says, may it be for this one as well when you make the offer them uh, outside of their physical presence or in a way that there's no conflict of interest and so you think if you ask for jannah for people who if they're not the people of jannah then we don't cross a line this is allah's decision to make he can do what he wishes uh, uh, and he chooses who he forgives and who he doesn't and it's his decision to make but also you know we have a mind we have eyes and ears we can see you know kind of like this looks like it's going in a good direction this looks like it's not going in such a good direction um that those people that you see the 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 signs of of piety and righteousness when you make dua for them to go to jannah it's there's not a lot of resistance from <laughs> one guesses to that dua and so when the angel says may it be for you as well who's the one seemingly benefiting more from the dua it's us this is one of the great manifestations of the mercy of the Lord that he put people like this in the world so that people like us, broken people and uh, kind of lazy and half-witted people like us, we have uh, something to fall back on uh, for a day when all the you know fancy talking and the, the turbans and jubbas and all of the degrees and, and staffs and big crowds and all these things end and and the search is just made for in what's inside the heart. Was there anything there or not? Um, that on that day uh, uh, that, that he left some things for us, which is really just low-hanging fruit. It's just really low-hanging fruit. You can cash it in again and again and again, and you don't have to be super learned. You don't have to be super pious even in order to cash it in. In fact, some of the people who have the most love for the Ahlullah are themselves, people who are Mubtala, Allah has tested them with sins that they have difficulty giving, giving up. Uh, uh, and th this is a, 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 a firm hold that if a person... Uh, you know, holds on to it, that they still have some hope for good and some hope that something or another will pull them in, change their lives for the better, and a hope that no one should ever give up. 
because it's completely it's easy it's easy to love a person uh, like these people were so that a person should you know uh, cultivate and develop that love and so this is why we tell the stories of the olia this is why we mention uh, something about the mashaikh when teaching their books this is why we take these trips to different places for those who are able to go along um, and this is why it's it's a good thing it's not some extraneous like hero worship type of thing uh, uh, rather, everybody knows uh, and hero worships, uh, you know, soccer, play, football players and uh, basketball players and politicians and, you know, Elon Musk and, you know, plutocrats and all of these people. They're celebrated so much for their money to the point where people like they just like savor every titillating detail, even of their dysfunctionalities. Leave it. These people, these people are. They're animals. Anybody who is that greedy uh, and anybody who is that, you know, or can do a stupid human trick. I say this, mashallah, somebody can throw a ball from halfway across the court or run and jump and uh, stick their tongue out and like smash a ball into, into a hoop. It's ultimately, it's a stupid human trick. It's not something that's going to bring anybody happiness. Uh, it's not going to solve anybody's problems. It's not going to help an orphan. It's not going to feed the hungry. It's not going to set a person up for true happiness in this world as a hereafter is it haram okay maybe you'll find someone who says it's not haram that's fine take that opinion it's a legitimate opinion and whatever but it's it's a small thing in the scheme of things somebody who's a plutocrat or somebody who loves power and money so much that they're willing to undercut every uh, sense of uh, ethics and morals in order to get to it uh, those people are not really heroes they're just uh, uh, human beings with uh, you know the internal disposition of uh, of snakes a snake all it does is it lays in the grass and then it eats and then when it's full it goes and lays in the grass for another three four days until it's time to eat again no need for hands no need for legs no need for art no need for poetry no need for beauty no need for uh, family no need for anything uh just go eat and come back into the grass like, it doesn't make sense to me why why such people should be celebrated so there are a lot of people much that have this kind of OCD that is this shirk is that shirk is this shirk is it no like worshiping an idol that's shirk don't do it uh, attributing the powers of Allah Ta'ala to other than Allah Ta'ala is shirk don't do it but the love of the awliya the love of the ahlullah it's actually one of the not only is it a an act of piety it's one of the greatest acts of piety that was summarized by the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as mar'u ma'man a person will be with the one that they love so this is this is uh, uh, the reason that uh, you know even I who I felt sh ashamed that you should even put my name on the same uh, 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 the same whatever advertisement as that of our mashaykh because I know who they are and I know who I am. But if nothing else, we can share uh, just that so that somebody else can take a part of the muhabba. Inshallah, uh, the embarrassment that it will look like on the day of judgment, inshallah, will be mitigated by the benefit people get it uh, from it by Allah's fadl. Embarrassment, Sheikh. Um, but Jazakallah Khair for, for taking your time out to join us. You will be going to Bosnia, I think it's in the last week of August. So if people want to check out the Imam Ghazali Institute, the tours it's called i can't remember revival tours there's a name for it if you, I don't know if you want to share send you, i can send you the link the other thing i i wanted to mention is that uh and in uh andalus um and it's a politically coming to power saw a revival in the renaissance of, of piety in about 250 years or so uh and uh you know they even though politically it collapsed centrally uh and uh, spiritually uh, every day and uh, we're still indebted to it i sent you a link for Afin, who is um one of the the, the renewers uh, classical form of uh, um and so inshallah if you could share that as well i would appreciate it the link uh, inshallah i'll send you the link as well and everybody is welcome to sign up you don't have to be from the united states or whatever uh, going on vacation but making sure that your salat is prayed on time your food is halal, uh, having a good time because sometimes when you're not familiar with a place a lot can pass you by uh, in the limited time that you have while you're still trying to orient yourself and look around for things. So everybody's welcome to come to that as well. And you're also welcome to link uh, I a Telegram group. I have a, a group where I post lectures and classes, and I have a separate group for questions and answers. Uh, uh, and so you're also welcome to join uh, it, whichever of those seems uh, beneficial to you and to uh, benefit and contribute as well. Uh, Barakallahu feekum, uh, also Mawlawi uh, Asim uh, for putting this together and uh, uh, for making this happen. 
and uh, uh, you know, Allah Taala, Allah Taala make all of our meeting one day uh, again. Uh, the awwalin and the akhirin, uh, whoever loved Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, that make our meeting together in pi in happiness in Jannah one day. Amin. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakallah khair to you. Uh, Shaykh, what we'll do, we'll, we'll, on our socials, we'll just send out all the details for the talks and the... Um, I'm on the Telegram chats, both of them, and uh, I do follow them. So I, I think there's a lot of benefit in doing that. So people, inshallah, if you look for Shaykh Hamza's Telegram chats, maybe if you go on his Twitter page where he was active, I don't know if he still is, you can find um, links to the Telegram page, inshallah. And hopefully... Well, we'll do, I think what would be nice is if we do a follow-up to talk about your time in Uzbekistan, maybe once you come back from Bosnia, we'll do two-in-one, inshallah, reflections on the history of Islam. But thank you so much again, Sheikh, uh, for joining us. And, and, and we hope that this is uh, this gathering is is a hasana in that from the hasanat of Sheikh Muhammad Hadameen. Amen. Uh, and, uh, and Allah Ta'ala elevates his ranks. I don't know if you want to finish with a short dua for the Sheikh and, and, and then for, for us as well. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Rabbana la tuzigh qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahmatan innaka antal wahhab. Rabbana ghfir lana dhunubana wa kaffir anna siyyatina wa tawafana ma'al abrar. ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم الله مقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معاصيك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون علينا مصائب الدنيا اللهم متعنا بأسماعنا وأبصارنا قواتنا ما أحييتنا وجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا وانصرنا على من عادانا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا تجعل الدنيا فتنتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا اغفر لنا وارحمنا وتقبل منا واختم لنا بالحسن ووفقنا لما تحب وترضى به وانصر وارفع بأيدينا راية الإسلام بركة الفاتحة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to the sheikh, to the viewers, do share, subscribe and uh, inshallah ta'ala let your friends know um, anybody who has any interest in, in, in this, inshallah, that there is uh, this talk that they can listen to, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.